You're on CY Interview. I'm Chris Yannick, featured columnist Jay Bilstein is with me today on CY Interview. We welcome filmmaker Stephen Edwards. On August 16th, his documentary film, Syndrome K, will be released on a variety of TV on demand and digital platforms. Stephen, thanks for joining us on CY Interview. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me. Oh, well, we're glad to have you this morning. So just to begin, um, your documentary focuses on a group of doctors who make up a disease, a disease that does not exist called Syndrome K, to save Jewish people from the Nazis during World War II who lived in Rome. Can you give us a little background about the film and how you came across the subject? Well, it's, it's a really interesting story because um, I had made a, another movie that actually about my late mother called Requiem for My Mother, which also took place in Vatican City. And um, my mother was Sicilian, and when she passed away in 2006, after she passed away, I actually got my Italian citizenship. So I sort of became this sort of adopted child of Italy. And so then people would start emailing me, asking me for you know restaurant recommendations in Rome, blah, 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 stuff like that. And I was looking online one day, and... Uh, helping someone find, you know, just get restaurant names. And I saw this link about this story, Syndrome K. And coincidentally, a couple of my friends shared it on Facebook. And I was like, wow, this is an amazing story. And I want to see this documentary. So I started clicking around on, you know, Netflix, Hulu, you know, the usual suspect streamers to find this film. And there was no film. I couldn't believe it. 75 years later that no one had made a film about this astonishing story. So I immediately started to, like, research it, and I found out that Dr. Ozzuccini, who had invented Syndrome K, was still alive, living in Rome at almost 99 years old. And so the wheels started turning very quickly after that, and I found a Jewish journalist in Rome who knew Dr. Ozzuccini and was willing to get us an interview. So I basically booked the next flight and flew over there. And uh, that's how the doc was born. And we sat Dr. Ozzuccini down and two Roman Jews who were survivors who are now in their 80s. And then the son of the sort of the boss doctor of the hospital, uh, Mr. Borromeo, and uh, did, you know, a couple days of interviews and shot some film at Fatih Bene Fratelli Hospital, which is the hospital where it takes place. And that's how the doc was born. Actor Ray Liotta is the narrator for this film. He just recently passed away. How did he become part of the project? Uh, yeah, we were so sorry to lose Ray. Um, so Ray's daughter, Carson, and my daughter, Bella, went to school together, K-8 and uh, 9-12. through 12. And so they've been friends since they were little. And um, I basically sent him an email, and I said, hey, you know, we're looking for a narrator. Is this something you're interested in? And he was sitting at the Toronto Film Festival at the time, and his daughter Carson was sitting with him. They were at the premiere of a movie called Divorce. And uh, so he just turns to Carson and goes, Who, who's this guy, Steve Edwards, and who's Bella Edwards? And she said, oh, my gosh, she's my good, my good friend. And so he, he circled right back and said, this sounds great. I'd love to do it. And, uh, you know, a couple of weeks later, there he is standing in my studio, narrating my film. Um, and it's interesting, you know, we went, my, my writer, uh, Greg Ballard, and my editor, Greg Hunter, and I, before Ray got there, we sat down and watched the first hour of Goodfellas. <laughs> and, you know, talk about iconic narration. You know, in the history of cinema, you know, maybe there's Morgan Freeman with Shawshank. There's Ray with Goodfellas. There's a few other you know, truly iconic narrations that I, that I think of. And we couldn't believe that 20 minutes Ray's showing up to my studio to do my little film. Uh, it was really such a joy to work with him. He was, you know, hilarious, super professional, profane, just a blast to be around, full of life, energy. You know, he's the heartbeat of our film. He's the, he's the storyteller of our film. He's the, he's the you know, he's the tour guide. Okay. And, uh, you know, we were so sorry to lose him. It was just a really sad day for all of us. Jake? Uh, Stephen, you know, I, over the years, have known some Hollywood people and all, and they talk about what it's like to get a film made. And um, getting a film made, specifically a feature film, I'm not talking about a documentary right now, sounds to me almost like science fiction. 
Um, even films that went on to become absolute monster hits, like Forrest Gump, if I remember, that was like a nine-year process of being shopped and working on getting things made. And one of the things I've heard people talk about is they've got to have this kind of very pithy presentation to execs. Sometimes people call it an elevator pitch. How can they get the idea across very quickly? So when I was watching your excellent documentary, I was sitting back and thinking, how would this be presented if you wanted to go a feature film route? Would If I say this to the general public, would I be awful? Would you nuance this or change this? Schindler's Syndrome. <laughs> That's great. Well, it's funny you mentioned you know feature films because we are uh, very actively developing a narrative version of this. Um, I've got a producing team together, and we're actually we've got a Zoom call with a director this week that's really interested in doing it. So uh, we you know we have a completed script. Um, we've got a major talent agency helping us. So um, we fully expect to make a movie based on this doc. Um, but, you know, talk about the greatest elevator pitch. You know, three doctors in a Catholic hospital make up a fake disease that fools the SS. One of the doctors is a Jew practicing in a Catholic hospital, you know, saving members of his own family right under their nose. They never figure it out. You know, it's like, in, in a, you know, everybody basically survives. Like, it's, it's, that's a pretty, ding, you know, a pretty good elevator pitch, <laughs> you know. In terms of, you know, pithy and telling the story and, and, you know, just seems really compelling in, you know, the eternal city, Rome, right smack a dab in the middle of, you know, all the action, the seat of the Catholic Church, you know, the, the pageantry. I mean, it's just, it just doesn't get much better than this. A hundred percent agreed. You know, we are going through, uh, in the United States, tough times right now. Uh, economically, with inflation, uh, with political polarization. Uh, we are still not completely out of the woods with a pandemic. I always find it interesting that when we look back at history, we tend to think, well, those were historic times. Those were unique times. Those were different times. You, you, you know, we're not living in those kind of times. And then, of course, when you fast forward and history is you, later written, it may well turned out that we lived through those times. Do you think concepts like bravery and, and being stalwart in the face of tremendous potential personal loss by doing the right thing, by doing what our humanity and humanness calls upon us to do, do you think your, your documentary presents that in such a way that it can give people a message now about standing up and doing the right thing, even at times when it comes in the face of tremendous potential personal cost? That's a great question. I think, you know, I think it's when you have such a great example presented in front of you by just regular old people that showed that bravery and showed that, you know, and it's so Italian, I mean, which I just love. I mean, I'm also Italian. I'm also became a citizen of Italy, so I've sort of adopted this country and embraced it, and the Brunello and the pasta and all of it, you know. Um, but you know, these these doctors just sort of did it because it was the right thing to do, you know. And I love the quote from Dr. Ossetini that says, "Bravery always wins." Yeah, but that was uh, toward the B. I, I what was that about four or five minutes or in? No, bravery always wins. Yeah, and also at the very end, <clears throat> it was my favorite thing he said the whole day. And, you know, what Mr. Borromeo said when he, you know, he held up his index finger and looked in the camera and said, you know, there's only one human race. Um, so, you know, these guys and girls, you know, were just a stand for doing the right thing no matter what. And I think, you know, examples teach people. And when people see other people that are just regular people doing great things, it might inspire them to do great things too. So who am I to predict what people will do? But this is the best part of humanity. This is people at their very, very best in the face of people at their very, very worst. You know? 
know, it, it, it's interesting. We just had on CY interview a couple of weeks ago a group of business people, all with families, who decided to raise money uh, to get medical supplies for people in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. And they didn't just raise the money. They then got on a plane and flew to Poland and got on a train, I believe, and went into Ukraine. And the next thing you know, you see them on a building top in Kiev with a missile landing a mile and a half, two miles away. And, you know, they had everything to lose, right? Yeah. Yeah. They had everything to lose, but it wasn't good enough just to raise the money. They actually went there to deliver the medical supplies. And I, I think the story... Uh, which is a true story that you've told, is a timeless story about the triumph of good over evil, no? Good over evil and regular people doing, you know, ordinary people doing extraordinary things in the face, right under the nose of the most extraordinary villains we've ever had, you know, certainly in the 20th century, maybe in history, in terms of how much destruction they cause and atrocities they cause. Um, I just I just always think of the Italians flipping the bird to the Nazis. You know, they, they, there's no love lost there. And you heard Dr. Ossetini say it. You know, those, the Nazis never. You know, they don't care about anybody. He's you know still 75 years later. But it's like, eh, you know, screw them, basically. Well, you, you know, it, it's so interesting, and I'm so this touches me on a on a personal basis, Stephen, because my father was born uh, in Germany in 1932. He's 90 right now, thank goodness. And he is a Holocaust survivor. We are Jewish. And he escaped in 1938 with his family when he was six years old, just, uh, I think it was about 11 days before Kristallnacht, which was the night of broken glass when there were all kinds of Jewish shops destroyed and books burned and all this type of thing. And um, this had a formative effect on me growing up. And years later, when I was in college, I had the opportunity to go to Hebrew University in Jerusalem and to study European Jewry and the Holocaust. So wow. your documentary really hit home for me. What's so interesting, though, we've lost so much over time that if you go to many people who are in their teens or 20s or even early 30s, I don't think they truly understand the impact of what the Holocaust was, of the absolute mechanized genocide that the Nazis brought forward. And, of course, there were antecedents. Adolf Hitler said something to the effect of who today remembers uh, the genocide of the Armenians. He was referring to what happened with the Turks. And, unfortunately, this is a recurrent theme in history, which seems to get worse than I think at least to now, peaked with the Nazis, but it reminds me of the expression, all that's necessary for evil to persist are enough good people to do nothing, and here yep. you're a good person doing something by showing the general public the truest nature of bravery, again, by ordinary people doing extraordinary things in the, in the, in the face of potential grave, grave personal loss. Right. And so I thank you personally, and I'm so happy you've been able to come on with us. Well, you know, thanks for that. And um, I was saying in another interview that um, right as I was starting to to get the interviews and stuff together for Syndrome K, there was a, a bunch of stories, and you probably saw them, like on all the streamers and Yahoo News and all that, talking about how in the dark American kids are about the Holocaust and about what had happened. And that really, like very few percent even knew, you know, that was, you know, over 6 million Jews. Like there's just, the basic, basic, basic stuff that just, they just didn't know. And so it really, drew, it really inspired me. Like, if I can just tell my little story about this little microcosm in the middle of Rome, literally 200 meters between the hospital and the Jewish ghetto, about what these extraordinary people did under extraordinary circumstances, it tells the big story of the Holocaust, in a, even though it's a microcosm story. And you know, hopefully kids kids will see it, and it's you know, it will be it will be shown, it will be it will be seen, and it, and it will educate them, and it will show them, and it will inspire them to dig deeper, and to see more about, it, you know, and to and to understand what really happened. And you know, I go back to when I was 
a little kid, I saw a documentary on some channel in Detroit when I was 11 or 12 years old, and I really didn't know much about it because I hadn't gotten my high school history yet. And I sat my dad down, who was born in 1931, and I asked him the question, and he kind of sat me down and said, this is what happened. And, you know, I couldn't believe it. And, and so uh, I grew up in Ann Arbor, which is a town which has a really vibrant Jewish community, always has. And so I just got inspired to, you know, to learn more about it. And I've always been fascinated by World War II. My uncle was a pilot, flew 25 missions over Germany, uh, you know, 5% survival rate. He was my godfather. Um, I had several family members that, that were in both theaters in World War II. So um, it's close to home for me, too, even in a, in a, in a different way than your family. But, uh, wow, I mean, how, you know, how amazing, right? Well, we need more people like you, Stephen, doing this good work, and uh, we're very happy to let our base of followers, readers, and listeners know about it. And again, you should be commended, and I hope this does indeed become a feature film because that will draw people even more into the story. And again, the nature of bravery and also the nature of what took place during the Holocaust, and brave people stood up again, at, at, at potential grave costs themselves. Uh, Chris? Um, Stephen, in closing, the film will be out on August 16th. Can you let people know where it's going to be able to be seen? Yeah, uh, I think it starts... Uh, I have a distributor handling all that, so I'm just the, the filmmaker. It starts yeah. VOD. Yeah, and video on demand. Gonna, yeah. you know, it's going to go to streamers. I'm not even sure where it's going to be, perfectly honest. Um, but if you Google it, it'll it'll come up. Um, we have a website that shows some things about what we did and actually about okay, the we'll link to the website, of course. Yeah. And then, um, you know, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be out there. It'll be available for everybody to watch. Syndrome K comes out August 16th. So for filmmaker Stephen Edwards, featured columnist Jay Bilstein and CY Interview, I'm Christian.